back out at the southern end of the city, you would see the great steps to the temple. And these were known as the teaching steps. Jesus would have certainly taught his disciples in this fashion and possibly on these very steps. Note the partial arch that is still visible and compare it to the model of the city. That's where we were when we took these pictures. Back up the hill of the city to the houses with pink roofs. This area was a wealthier area. Herod's palace has been discovered along with a governor's guest home located on the same grounds. As you look down the elevation of the city from the west, you see the western wall of the second temple. The red arrow marks the place of the wailing wall. The wailing wall in its current place where you, you, you know, the pictures of people praying. The brown line that you see in the photo about the height of all the men. It's not a shadow, but it's actually grime. One of the impressions that most affected me was the thought of how many millions of touches would it take to make a wall so grimy. Of course, they do not intend to deface this wall. They pray there out of devotion. It's a wonderful tribute to those who would faithfully pray. If we touched a wall every time we prayed, I wonder, would it get very dirty? We also saw some young boys who were learning their prayers and who will one day be cantors. But kids are kids, no matter where you go. And one of the boys was looking all around, leaning back in his chair, being a kid. And I'm reminded that Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. This square structure on the back corner of the temple is known as the Antonia Fortress. Look at John chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? When Herod built the temple... The Antonia Fortress was added for the Roman militia, and it sweetened the deal for Rome. He was a wicked king, but he was a crafty politician. He had men quarry the stones for eight or nine years before he even started the building project. And the priests had to be the ones that built the temple. So they had to be employed to build it. And I just wondered, could you imagine what kind of building we'd have if only the pastor, Brother Dan, and I could build it. I think we'd be in big trouble. So when the stones were all quarried, Herod started building. And so he sent word to Rome that he wanted permission to build the temple. And so he instructed the messenger that he sent to Rome. He said, take your time going to Rome. And you know what? I always thought that I was the originator of the philosophy. It's easier to ask forgiveness than to ask permission. But actually, Herod the Great uh, must have come up with that idea on his own uh, thousands of years before me. Well, beyond the fortress, you see a wall. And that's an important wall because on the other side is an area that the Catholic Church points to as the site of the crucifixion. So out this gate would be the Via Della Rosa, or the Way of Suffering. Now today, it's a narrow passage. And this was a very difficult walk. Some of it is emotional. Some of it's just puzzling. And some of it's depressing. We had almost 40 people in our group, and I think that we all came away with different experiences from this particular portion of the trip. For me, I found it difficult to balance my emotions against things that I found troubling or puzzling. Here I am tracing the final steps of Christ, not literally, but emotionally. And I must walk through a chaotic circus atmosphere. Quiet reflection is drowned out by the sounds of commerce. The dollar is praised. Trinkets are worshipped and adored. If there was no room for Jesus in the end, there was certainly no room for him on the Via Della Rosa. From the alley... 
you finally emerge at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Catholic Church marks this as the traditional site of the crucifixion and burial of Christ. At one time, the entire face of this building was covered in marble like these pieces pictured. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? It would have certainly been impressive. Inside, you find the final three stations of the cross. Now, people will line up by the hundreds to kneel, kiss, and pray at each of these shrines. There's another gate on this side of the city. It's the Damascus Gate. And there's another site marked as the site of the crucifixion known as the Garden Tomb. It's over a hundred years ago. An English officer was working in this area and looked up and saw this cliff edge. And he'd been reading his Bible about the crucifixion and noted that the Gospels of Mark and John called it the place of the skull. And he thought, that kind of looks like a skull. They did some further excavation in the area and they discovered a large cistern. In fact, it was the largest in Jerusalem. Now the significance of such a find is that it would indicate there was a garden here. Because a hundred years ago there is certainly no garden here at all. In fact, it was a dump. They decided to remove the rubbish. Some 35 feet or so covered the entire area that we now call the garden tomb. The garden tomb is a wonderful find. It is certainly a tomb. It is certainly the tomb of someone wealthy. We know this because of the large section on the left inside that was for mourners. In ancient days, you could pay mourners to come and cry over your dead loved ones. And if you were very wealthy, you could afford many. And some ladies were professional mourners. They could cry and they would save their tears in a bottle. And if you were a good mourner, you'd have this bigger bottle to collect your tears. Now, this tomb, it was not built, rather it was hewn out of the side of a hill from solid rock. It was a Jewish tomb, and that's noted by the sole window in the upper right-hand corner. A trough runs along the face of the tomb outside where a stone would roll. Now, this stone is a much smaller stone, the one that we see here as a specimen, but uh, it's smaller than the one that would have been used in such a wide trough. So for this particular tomb, a great stone would have been required. Is this the place? Well, it was only used once. There were two burial pallets, but only one was ever used. Extra space for the feet had to be cut in to make room for whoever was buried here. Just outside the tomb, there were some interesting impressions made in the stone. This heart-shaped area used to be a baptistry. A small chapel had been located at this site hundreds of years ago. The building had been made in such a way as to include the tomb. This welcome mat-sized indention is not natural, but was cut into the rock for the purpose of washing feet. The activities performed at this location by a group of believers is also a strong indication that this is the site of the tomb that Jesus was placed in. Without a doubt, our visit to the garden tomb was the highlight of the trip. And if you ever get a chance, you should certainly make the journey. You know, it's not impossible, and it's surprisingly accessible. You could maybe make it a three- or four-year goal, but uh, if I could do it, I would imagine just about anyone could. 